Hello and welcome to the In Publishing Podcast. My name is James Evely and I'm the editor of In Publishing. My guest this time is Jim Bilton of Wessenden Marketing, who spoke to us about the recent Media on Media survey, which canvassed people in the media about their favourite films, TV programmes and books about the media, along with their thoughts on the most influential figures in the media sector today. Jim tells us about the enduring appeal of the 1970s film All the President's Men. Well, I think it's still the definitive account of what journalism is all about. Um, And I think in the current world of fake news and political power and the ability of politicians to manipulate the need for independent journalism uh, and the reality of there still being facts out there to find, I think ring true with so many people working in the media business now and gives us the less than flattering description from one survey respondent on one of the titans of the media world. I suspect that one of the most powerful men who has ever lived really is as clueless and conscience-free as his public appearances suggest. And about why people, both inside and outside the industry, are so fascinated by the media. But it's an industry that intrigues the outside world and also uh, on one of the main takeaways, we ourselves who are on the inside of it, uh, love it, are invested in it. It has its frustrations, it has its scary moments. Um, But I think we also believe that it's important. Amongst many other things. But first, a quick word about our valued sponsors. We would like to thank our podcast sponsor, Advantage CS, a leading global provider of subscription and membership management software. Capabilities include marketing, sales, payments, and customer relationship software for publishers, membership associations, and information providers. For more information, go to advantagecs.com. Jim Bilton is the driving force behind the recent Media on Media survey, which asked people who worked in the media what their all-time favourite films, TV shows and books about the media were. The survey also asked respondents to answer the question, who is the most influential person in media at the moment, for good or ill? Which, as you can expect, produced some fascinating answers. Jim Bilton, welcome to the In Publishing podcast. Thank you, James. Thank you for having me. Now, let's start at the beginning, Jim. What, what prompted you to do, to do the Media on Media survey in the first place? Well, it started out as a bit of lockdown fun. But I think like most people uh, during lockdown, I've been watching a lot more TV and thrashing my Netflix subscription, but in a rather random way. And I just got sort of fed up of um, digging up bodies in Norway and Sweden with depressing detectives. Uh, and I started to venture out a bit. And I came across Citizen Kane, which I hadn't watched for years Uh, And the thought occurred to me, well, what other media films are there? And I started looking through the inventory and there are loads of them. And so I was comparing notes with other people in the business. But the thought came to me about having a more structured poll um, and a poll of people who know what media is all about. So it's still a bit of fun, but there's a serious side to it because I think how our industry is presented to the outside world is actually very important, particularly at a time when the role of media and media control, uh, media ownership are all big issues. And I think the debate is shaped in a subtle way by the books and the TV programmes and the films that people are watching. So you, we are, you found out about films, TVs, books. Let, let's go through the results um, right, and get okay. your insights from them. So starting with the film category, um, what came out on top? Uh, the one that came out on top by a long way was All the President's Men. So All the President's Men was number one. Then came Spotlight, another investig- investigative, <laughs> I can't say it, uh, film um, about... Uh, the Boston Globe investigating child abuse, then the Post, so back to the Washington Post again, a magazine only one, The Devil Wears Prada, number four, and then His Girl Friday, a bit of a lateral one in from the 1940s. But those, those are the top five. And, you know, the, all, the president, all the President's Men, how do you explain the enduring appeal of that? Because obviously that came out 
well, I'm, I'm, well, Watergate was the early 70s, so I imagine the film came out soon after that, but it that's obviously a, still top of the list. It was 1976. Well, I think it's still the definitive account of what journalism is all about. Um, and I think in the current world of fake news and political power and the ability of politicians to manipulate the need for independent journalism uh, and the reality of there still being facts out there to find, I think ring true with so many people working in the media business now. And also it harks back to a golden age. I think the 1970s was a, a real golden age in terms of journalism and media. And there are a lot of stories and a lot of films that came out during that period. And I think also, uh, I think men of a certain age like to be thought of as Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford. <laughs> right. And, and do you think there's a tinge of nostalgia in some of the people who voted for that? You know, do they look back on them as being very different from now in terms of the newsroom? I think so, yes. I mean, one of the interesting comments, and I'll, I'll quote some of the verbatim comments from time to time, but the, the, here's an interesting one, that the idea of digging for truth rather than creating data-driven content, is so much more appealing and noble. Uh, Very I interesting. Think, I think that's a rather weary journalist mm. who's uh, being robotized at the moment. Uh, and outside the top five, any surprises on the list? The, I mean, what surprised me was um, how low Citizen Kane came down. It was number six. Um, and I would have thought that it would be close to the top. It's still the definitive statement of what an old style media mogul should look like. But perhaps it's more of a, a filmmaker's film, um, which was very uh, leading edge in its time, but seems a bit dated now. 1941 was when Orson Welles made it. Uh, many of our younger media insider voters, and we also involved uh, four universities to drive to their own students. Um, most of the students had heard about it, but very few had actually seen it. So I think there is an age issue there. And also since uh, 1941, there's been so much good uh, product that's, that's, that's come through. Uh, and looking at those those top five, do you think, was there more of a tilt towards um, news newspaper based storylines as opposed to magazine? Yes, well, I, th I think like in many things, and and you know certainly in supply chain terms, the focus and the the media focus and the political focus is on news, uh, but I think magazines creep up and are. Uh, representative of a lifestyle in a, in a much more more subtle way. So The Devil Wears Prada came in as the top magazine one. The uh, Another one that came lower down is How to Build a Girl, which is a 2019 film, where the comment was, um, this is EMAP in the 1990s, and what it was like working on a music mag. Hedonistic, male-dominated, the power of print, sex, and drugs. We could never do it now, but it just seemed normal then, um, which I think is, is a fascinating insight, insight from someone who used to work at EMAP as well. Was. Of its, as you say, of its time, probably. Yes, yes. Well, I'll just say a, a relatively recent film. So uh, the, there's, there's the mix of uh, films that have been produced relatively recently, but also on what period they hark back to. But as, as I said earlier on, the 1990s, um, sorry, 1970s, very much. Well, one of the slightly weird ones that came in was a Bond movie, um, Tomorrow Never Dies. Um, Remind which, me how that fits into the, the, the media landscape. Well, that, uh, the, the, again, the comment here, when a media mogul becomes a power-crazed madman intent on world domination in a Bond movie, you know you're working in the right business. <laughs> so it is the, the, uh, the Bond villain was someone who controlled media events or controlled events and then reported them in his own media outlets, um, which, is, uh, which even Murdoch can't do that. <laughs> now, persistent journalism seems to be a popular subject matter. Um, are, are there, in your opinion, any major pieces of investigative journalism over the last decade which you think would make good material for a film? 
I think there's a lot that's going on uh, at the moment. Um, what's happened in Malta, what's happened in Turkey. Um, th there are a number of journalists and journalist deaths and assassinations over the last couple of years which could make good movies. The movie I I'd actually like to see is uh, Jeff Bezos uh, buying the uh, the Washington Post because I think there's a very interesting fly on the wall film there. But uh, there's so much material that we as an industry produce, which we find interesting, but also I think is interesting to the world outside. Now onto the TV programs. Um, what what the top five in that category? The top five again by a long margin uh, drop the dead donkey um, a surprisingly large margin despite its age I think it's partly because BBC iPlayer in its wisdom was trying to thrash its back inventory and it's been pushing uh, drop the dead donkey but the uh, the comments on it uh, about it being the definitive statement about uh, working in a again it's a news uh, TV station uh, but working in news. Uh, again, one of the comments, allegedly the creators wanted to create a show about office politics, and they settled on a newsroom as being the most extreme place for office politics. All which right. I, I think is a rather interesting comment. But Drop the Dead Donkey was number one. Number two, uh, and because it dominates current live output, is Succession. Um, which is funny and based clearly on the Murdoch family. Number three was a 2018 series called um, Press, which is really about the Guardian versus the Sun. Um, and then number four is The Bold Type, which is a magazine entry that, that slots in uh, there, which is currently live. Uh, and then number five is a real oldie goldie is Lou Grant. Um, wow, which, is that another seven? Is that from the seventies as well? Seventy, seventy-seven to nineteen eighty-two. I'm turning into a media trivia bore. Here, <laughs> so I know when all of these. You know it all. <laughs> but in fact, was a spin-off from a show that uh, also scored uh, quite highly, which is the Mary uh, Tyler Moore show which going going back to that of a woman making her way in a news organization so it's 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 a very eclectic mix i mean it seems that the films may maybe uh, is it is film a better medium for media stories than tv do you think that's an interesting one uh, it it's you've got a completed story in a film so you can see it from beginning to end and i suppose the storytelling element of it is complete uh, but the the TV uh, output is uh, very wide ranging. It's a mix of the factual and the fictional, of the gritty and the glossy. But I think there's a strong thread of humour and satire that runs through the TV show output. Uh, again, another one, which is one of my favourites, is W1A uh, about the BBC which um, ran up to 2017, but I think uh, also is being accessed again through the iPlayer back inventory. Uh, and outside the, the, the top five, any other ones stand out from you apart from that one? Uh, as I say, it's, it's, it's a real mix of um, you've got Mad Men, which is more about advertising. You've got uh, Selling Hitler, which was a, a, a factual series. And um, the Mary Tyler Moore show. Again, I think that's a, a reflection on age. And also we picked up in the poll some American um, people who took part in the survey. So I think the Mary Tyler Moore show, again, captures a time and a place when uh, TV news was changing. Now, on to books and um, re reading your analysis, Jim, you mentioned that, that somebody said they didn't particularly, you know, one of our respondents said they, they weren't really into books. Exactly, so, um, yes. Which, which amused me. Um, yeah. uh, what do you read into that and the choices people made? I think, well, it, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, as to whether film and TV is a more engaging medium to represent what is happening in our own industry. But books really seem to polarise people. As you say, the comment is, you're either into books or you're not, and I'm not, was one very definitive 
statement. Um, and they vary quite a bit between the uh, the factual list and the the fictional list. So the top five factual books, uh, Harold Evans has got two of them. So Good Times, Bad Times was way up at the top. Then number two is My Paper Chase, so a broader uh, account of his life in the newspaper business. Good Times, Bad Times is very much about Murdoch uh, and his relationship with him. Then we get um, number three is Alan Rusbridger, News and How to Use It which is more of a, a fact book about um, how the business operates. Flat Earth News, which is looking at the how sponsorship um, influences how uh, news is recorded. Uh, and then my favourite, number five, which is Nicholas Coleridge and Paper Tigers. But I think that the, the factual books is a real mix of media history and how it works explanations, biographies, uh, and journalism textbooks. But, and, but dear old Harry Evans runs through the list from top to bottom. Uh, so tell me, Jim, the, the Nicholas Coleridge book, well, I haven't read it myself, I confess. Why, why did you enjoy that one so much? Well, I think it's a book that only Nicholas could actually pull off because he interviews all the people he talks about. So he's on first name terms, was with Robert Maxwell and Rupert Murdoch. And he, he went around the world um, interviewing them all. Uh, and it is, uh, it's wonderful storytelling. It's, it's a bit dated now. Uh, and it... Um, it also is very newspaper focused. So again, the, there is this uh, news angle to all of this, but it's one of the most comprehensive takes on what is a very odd bunch of people, media moguls, most of whom were probably bullied at school uh, and that owning media properties is their way of getting back at the world. But it's, it's, it's a wonderful um, Nicholas Coleridge tour, literal tour of the world. And Harold Evans obviously appeared twice in the top five. I think two of his books also appeared in the in the rest as well. So obviously, well, as well, as we all know, a hugely influential figure. Yes, both in terms of describing what the business is actually like, but also in terms of producing textbooks. Um, Pictures on a Page is a 1978 Harry Evans one, which is the classic on photojournalism. So he was just uh, an expert and, and someone clearly who loved writing and writing books, uh, perhaps more than people wanted to read them. And in terms of fiction, where, what, what were the popular choices in that, that category? Now, this was really random. And the number <laughs> one choice, and I think it may have been yours too, James. I confess it was, yes. Is, is Scoop, Evelyn War, 1938. Um, it's really random. Uh, I think one person's comment was that the the whole genre of fictional books about the media is pretty poor. Uh, but also, I think there is an element of this category which captures why people came into the media business in the first place. And I think Scoop um, clearly motivated and excited a, a, a lot of people. Well, how about you? Because you, you put it down as, as your choice. Well, I did. Well, I, can, I confess it was a long time ago I read it. Um, I think even when I read it, which must have probably been in the 90s, it was dated even then. But I just thought there were some essential truths coming through. I thought it still painted a, a picture which had relevance today. And I couldn't, couldn't actually tell you the storyline in great detail, but it, it, it was quite, it was a bit of a page turner, I felt. Yes, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, again, one of the comments, it isn't politically correct, and it doesn't represent modern journalism, but uh, it's a great read and very thought-provoking. So that's a 1938, that was way out, number one. Number two is Towards the End of the Morning, which is 1967, which is Michael Frey. Uh, New Grub Street goes back to 1891. Uh, which I is think a, we need some new books, a, don't a we? A wild choice, yes, yes. The the only sort of relatively modern one is actually my personal favourite, which is Ray Connolly's Sunday Morning, 
which is a wonderful evocation of uh, magazines and newspapers from the swinging 60s through to the 70s, when just everything was, was, was possible. Um, so that's 1992 that, that Ray wrote that one. And then number five, uh, The Way We Live Now, which is Anthony Trollope, you know, going back to 1875 again. So, uh, again, it's, it's a lot of the principles as to what draws people into the media business, but a very wide um, range in terms of topic and of of the age of the book. It might be that most people in the media, when they come to read, they read magazines and newspapers rather than books. Well, I think so. I, I think that you, you're either a real bookie or you're not. There's a Geoffrey Archer there, Fourth Estate. Um, a good but easy read, Shame. It's by Geoffrey Archer, though. It was, was the, the comment of one person who recommended it. Um, and then you've got Graham Greene, the, the Quiet American, which is 19... 19- 55. Interestingly, a book that was made into a film. And I, I wonder whether there's an argument that the film was better than the book. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, and now that the question which probably provoked the, the most interesting response, the, the one almost a supplementary question, um, the most influential person in media at the moment for good or ill, um, who, who came out on top? Uh, two people came neck and neck with Mark Zuckerberg just edging ahead of Rupert Murdoch. So two uh, very different people, but you can understand why both of them came out top. Uh, one of the comments which captures it, uh, and I think most people's view, uh, and again, I'm quoting verbatim on this one, I suspect that one of the most powerful men who has ever lived really is as clueless and conscience-free as his public appearances suggest. And that's incredibly scathing, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. But uh, uh, someone with immense power who doesn't quite realise the power that he's got, uh, but is clueless about the curation, the, the responsibility of being a publisher that he just doesn't seem to get or doesn't care about. So you've, you've got them. Somebody else who came much lower down the list but is of the same ilk in terms of their position is Tim Cook of Apple. Uh, so although Mark Zuckerberg is very high profile, Tim Cook seems to be more highly respected by people in the media business uh, than the Facebook chief. So you've got Zuckerberg there who just edges it ahead of Rupert Murdoch. Now, Murdoch is Citizen Kane, uh, a good old print newspaper, ruthless uh, dynasty building character, uh, but a real Marmite one. Um, his profile has been raised again by TV shows, interestingly, such as Succession. Uh, but I think this Sate or Satan dilemma, this Marmite uh, situation, is summarized in this quote, that his influence is both positive and negative. He invests in his products, knows that journalism has to be paid for, and is a fierce defender of the sector against outside big tech interests. Who else has really taken on Facebook? However, his interference in the editorial side of his titles is usually maligned, and his Fox News channel is positively toxic. Uh, so what do you make? of uh, Murdoch. And I think another interesting angle, because it's a media insider poll, we actually picked up a couple of people who had worked quite closely for Murdoch. And here's one comment. He understands journalists and writers. He knows what makes a good newspaper or magazine or movie. He is willing to see and hear your side of why you did what his papers and TV have changed our world. So that's a, a, a kinder view. But I think the weight of the poll is negative. And I just wonder whether uh, future generations will remember Murdoch more kindly uh, as perhaps the patron saint of paid content rather than someone who was almost satanic in his media control and manipulation. Uh, am I right? I think one respondent talked, or maybe it was you, Jim, in your analysis, talked about uh, what would happen if you had a kind of almost an imaginary merging of Zuckerberg and Murdoch. Um, so you had one, the reach of Zuckerberg and the 
the intent of Murdoch. Yes, no. This this is an, a yes a, a, a quote that, that Zuckerberg has massive reach, but I'm not sure he quite knows what to do with it. Murdoch would know what to do, but thankfully, even he doesn't have that scale. So the ultimate and scariest media mogul imaginable is is Zuckerdoc or, or Murdberg is is a combination of the two. But I, I think the view of the media insiders was that thankfully Murdoch doesn't have. Uh, Zuckerberg's reach and power. And I believe number three was Jeff Bezos, is that right? That's right, yes. Um, For his role uh, in the Washington Post. So I think uh, many of the media insiders aren't quite sure what to make of Jeff Bezos. On one hand, Amazon is lumped in with the other fang companies as being a hugely disruptive and all-pervasive force in the whole area of media and well and everything i mean it it is the everywhere shop as uh, i think bezos once described um, amazon as but it's as his owner and he bought out of his own money uh, the washington post back in 2013 uh, for 250 million dollars allegedly uh, without any due diligence he just liked it and bought it uh, but it's fascinating to see what he has done. It looks as though editorially he's kept his hands off, broadly speaking, the editorial direction, but he's invested in tech and a very clear marketing strategy and turning it from essentially a regional Washington-based uh, newspaper into uh, something that's much uh, is national and much more international as well. So he sees a business model behind it all, which turns the traditional model on its head. But it hasn't interfered to date in the editorial direction. But I think as an interesting aside, um, I call him a train set mogul. But I think there are a number of wealthy individuals, particularly in America, who have made their money elsewhere, uh, a lot of them actually in uh, digital organizations and who want to spend their money and love the idea of owning a media brand and a good old print newspaper. There's nothing like it. Uh, so I think we're witnessing the rebirth of the old fashioned media mogul, but with a, with a new overlay, but particularly in, in America. And uh, you mentioned, I think, we, we, relating to Jeff Bezos when he bought the Washington Post, he'd actually bought into, you know, the ethos of the paper and the, the moxie dies in darkness. So it sounds like he's he's bought into that. Yes, yes. And, and that is a phrase, that is a, a tagline that came out uh, after he, he actually bought it. But I, I think he was just so intrigued, uh, as so many people outside the media business are, so intrigued by the the glitz and the glamour. Perhaps there isn't so much glitz and glamour. There there is in the magazine business, um, and you know, the there's there's, there's a, a lovely quote on on the devil wears Prada that um, the it, it, this was the um, sort of martini soaked world uh, that I'd always wanted to to be a part of. Um, that was one of the uh, the media insiders' comments on on that. But but it's an industry that intrigues the outside world, and also uh, on you know one of the main takeaways: we ourselves, who are on the inside of it, uh, love it, are invested in it. It has its frustrations, it ha- has its scary moments, um, but I think we also believe that it's important. Um, that we could make a lot more money by doing something else, um, probably trading in bitcoins. But the uh, the media business itself has got into our uh, blood, got into our veins, got into our DNA, and we believe it's important and needs to be protected and preserved. Now, outside the big three, Jim, were there any other noteworthy names on the list, or any noteworthy trends in terms of the kind of people who are being, you know, put forward as influential people? Yeah, I, I think they fall into three categories. So you've got um, front end presenters and influencers. So people like um, Andrew Neil, Oprah Winfrey, uh, Piers Morgan. The comment here is, "I can't stand the man, but he speaks for many." So I think that the people who are presenting at the front end of uh, media. 
and particular media TV um, are influencing the agenda and the way that people perceive uh, the media business. And I think um, perhaps Piers Morgan is the most awful example uh, of that. Um, Tucker Carlson, so from the American correspondence, is the Fox News uh, anchor, but who seemed to, what did this, an influence for ill, his impact on the people who seem to believe every single nonsensical thing he bleats out every night further divides the United States and endangers our democracy. So, <laughs> and you, he, he might be the next president for all well, we know. Well, yes. He's the uh, part of the front end. So you've got presenters and influencers. The second category are politicians themselves. Um, so you've got Vladimir Putin there, Viktor Orban. Uh, you've got uh, Donald Trump when he was president. So there is increasing concern about political manipulation. And then the third category, uh, media insiders, a handful of senior media executives are mentioned who are influencing the industry from the inside. Um, the three notable ones who were mentioned, and they're all women, incidentally, Catherine Viner, uh, editor-in-chief at The Guardian, Zilla Bingthorne, future CEO, and Carolyn McCall, uh, the chief executive currently of ITV. Um, but do any of them have the power to make a real difference to the, the shape of the overall business? And there's one other group, which uh, I think you, you mentioned in an article, Jim, uh, which was referred to. It was a huge influence of the faceless people. We don't know. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that group? Yes, uh, this was one fascinating comment. I think the most influential person in media is completely unknown to us. They're probably working in a high-powered position at one of the big social media platforms, deciding content policy and directing or writing the algorithms, probably without any direction or guidance from the people who employed them. So the Zuckerbergs, the Tim Cooks, the Bezoses, it's these unknown people who are really influencing the agenda by what we are fed uh, because they're, they're controlling the algorithms that, that drive the, um, the platform coverage. Um, as an aside, do you think you know, the future will bring regulation and more regulation to try and control this situation? You had the situation with Facebook banning Donald Trump, um, not something I'm particularly against, but you, you wonder whether who has control over Facebook? Well, there's a whole issue there, and it's come up with the platforms starting to pay news outlets for their content. Uh, and obviously the, the, the Murdoch situation in Australia, where Facebook uh, closed uh, Facebook Oz down to news content providers whilst this was going on. So there was a battle there, but I think the conclusion was in terms of, of content and, and simply what uh, money, how much money the platforms pay news content providers need some kind of external control and regulation or arbitration system. Uh, but creating that is going to be is going to take years to uh, to actually do. But but yeah, it, at the moment, it's a, it's a mad free for all. So Jim, you might have touched on this already, but what do you think the response is to that question about you know influential people has told us about the changing nature of media ownership? Well, I think there's the. Uh... There's a lot going on behind all of those comments. I, th I think there is a general feeling amongst media insiders themselves that the media industry is losing control or has lost control. User-generated content is one aspect of it, uh, the democratization of news. Um, brand owners as publishers uh, and thinking that they know how to publish, but actually finding it's a bit more difficult. But there's a, a revenue opportunity there for media businesses and content marketing. But I think there is a sense that the overall control of the media is slipping out of their hands. In one sense, it's completely open and no one controls it. On the other hand, there is a sense 
that uh, control of the media seems to be concentrating into the hands of fewer and fewer players, the Zuckerbergs, the Murdochs, uh, and the politicians. So who owns a media outlet is of massive importance and needs more careful thought. And that doesn't simply mean restricting or excluding particular operators. I think it's the opposite of also allowing traditional media companies to consolidate and to build scale across different platforms in order to compete with the fang companies. But I think the nature of the ownership is very important as well as to whether it's publicly quoted, um, is it private equity or venture capital, uh, is it private and independent? And I think the, the thought process and the direction in which that media company goes is very much shaped by the nature of the ownership. And then at the same time, we've got individual uh, media moguls uh, coming back in, uh, all kinds of uh, different shapes and sizes. There's Citizen Kane, like uh, Murdoch. There's the train set mogul, like Bezos. There is, and the scary thought, and my um, suggestion for this was uh, Donald Trump, not as president, but if the persistent rumours that he wants to launch his own TV channel, uh, the thought of Donald Trump becoming a media mogul in his own right, where I think he is much more dangerous and divisive than as a president. At least there were some checks and balances, not that many when he was president, but as a media mogul, uh, he would be scary. Well, it'd be interesting if he were to do that. It'd be interesting to see what effect that had on Fox News. Yes, yeah. I mean, there, there are a whole series of knock-on effects if he actually went down that route. But I think another thing that comes through is is content curation, which is clearly is rapidly shifting from people to machines and AI. And um, what is media anyway? It has become increasingly difficult to define in our sort of mad whirlpool world but uh, the poll itself i think surfaced lots of issues and concerns but also how important facts are in a world of fake news and uncurated um, ai driven clickbait so looking on the uh, the entirety of the media or media project, you know, taking it as a whole, is that one of the key takeaways for you? And are there any others? I I think I think what I've listed there are are the main the main takeaways. But also, I, I think a personal one is, uh, as I've mentioned already, I think what it demonstrates is that we on the inside of media are as fascinated by the whole business as much as anyone else on the outside that it can be fun and glitzy, hard work, addictive, fast, but it's also very fragile. Uh, and in uh, a world in which we live at the moment, we're all emotionally invested in it and convinced of its importance in an open and free society, which is where one of my favourites, which nobody else chose, which is the, the Tom Hanks film, News of the World, um, which is about the power of media to um, bring peace and heal old wounds. It's set. It's, it's a weird film. It's, it's um, a media western. So it is Tom Hanks as a perambulating podcast. He goes from community to community with a saddlebag because this is just is set in just after a few years after the end of the American Civil War, when division and fragmentation and anger uh, and fake news um, was uh, was rampant. So he goes around and charges a dime a seat for people to come in and he reads from newspapers and puts their lives into perspective uh, and to lift their gaze from the grind and the prejudice of what was left in post-Civil War America. And the, it's the power of news. It's almost naively evangelical, but, but um, it, it, it's a fascinating film. Um, as I say, nobody else chose it, but I think it's great. <laughs> and also because I love Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks is also cornered. You're a big fan. 
cornered <laughs> the um, the media film market. Is in a lot of the, uh, the the big films in the in the poll. And presumably, um, News of the World is on Netflix or Amazon or or the, something similar and, and available when it people is. want to it, stream it. It's, yeah. it's on Netflix. It sounds as though I'm on commission, but I'm not. <laughs> uh, but it's it's well worth a watch, and people ought to write and tell me it's rubbish. Um, it, it's got a they know where to find you. It's got okay. a slightly gooey, uh, schmaltzy Tom Hanks ending, but um, I, I think it's really interesting and thought provoking. Now, Jim, while I've got you here, I must ask you about. Um, I know you're a keen observer of the industry. Um, I must ask you about the state of the publishing sector as you see it. So, as we start to emerge from the pandemic, um, you know, how do you see the outlook for news media, for consumer media, and, and B two B media? Yeah, I mean, uh, the broad common view is we are in a recovery, the start of a recovery of some description, and whether it's V or W or K-shaped seems to be the view at the moment that the economy in most developed markets is going to fragment and there'll be winners and losers. There are people who in the consumer field who will not recover from where they were. I mean, looking at the the figures that we monitor, it looks like total revenues across the whole media business, newspapers, consumer, B2B, dropped by between 9 and 10% last year. And our prediction is that it's going to come back into growth, about 2% growth in 2021. But I think that there are, there are key themes. Uh, resilience is a word. Uh, that is often repeated currently, which essentially means getting your own company in, in order to ride any of the unpredictable waves that come your way. So there's forensic cost control, uh, but there are other dimensions too. You're creating the new workplace post-pandemic of uh, building the culture and the organisation and the skills required to be horrible world agile but to be prepared for an unpredictable uh, future. That means constructing the right tech stacks to make all the strategies work and measuring everything, every process, every activity. And then you overlay on top sustainability, diversity, mental health. That's all lies behind resilience. Um, there's another word, which is hybrid, which is usually used at the moment in reference to the events industry, but I think can be applied to every single media business, that there are certain things happening that are happening more quickly than ever now of the shift from advertising revenues into reader revenues, the shift from print into digital, from in supply chain terms, from retail into subscriptions and membership. But it also covers uh, content delivery, that websites as the hub are there, e-newsletters are still very strong indeed as a platform, audio podcast well like this one of course audio and video um but i think for consumer the, the each each of those um markets and newspapers is very different they're spinning into a digital first digital only world very quickly um consumer and b2b i think are becoming uh, much more similar to each other and overlapping consumer is a few years behind b2b b2b led years ago mainly because classified advertising fell off the cliff very quickly indeed and they've reshaped their organizations consumer are uh, are catching up on that but print is still uh, very important. Um, we would reckon it's probably close to 50, 55% of consumer media revenue still come from print. So print isn't dead. Uh, and for many, including Generation Z, um, that the new generation are perhaps discovering print for the first time. But the, a lot of the research suggests that they're actually quite excited by it and see it as as the real thing they may not be prepared to pay for it uh, but uh, print is uh, is i think a key part of the medium and long-term future of consumer media and jim generally optimistic about the future yes goodness me um you had to say that, didn't yeah, you? Well, <laughs> well I, I, I think, um, yes. I mean, the optimism brings with it new challenges. So I would say you know, zooming in on 
consumer media and consumer magazines, for example, the real creativity is actually coming from the smaller companies uh, rather than from the large majors, I would say. I'll probably get shot for saying that. Uh, but there is a supply chain, certainly a retail supply chain issue, is which the retail supply chain is still very heavily geared to the, 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 the top titles. A recent PPA report showed that 80% of news trade revenues came from the top 148 magazines. Uh, now, how do you surface new product, specialist product, um, in that kind of environment? It's got to be digitally, and it's got to be direct to the consumer, uh, and it's got to be subscriptions rather than retail. So, so there are challenges, but there, I, I still feel very optimistic. And apart from anything else, I'm, I'm just, I just mindlessly love the business. And I think most of the people who responded to the poll feel the same way. That's, that's lovely to hear. Um, Jim, finally, what, you know, back to the, the media on media survey, I must ask, um, what are your own personal choices? What did you choose uh, and why? Poof, okay. Um, put me on the spot there. Um, the Post. I, I was torn between News of the World and The Post. I went for The Post uh, because, um, being a marketing person, I'm interested in the whole commercial story. So whereas All the President's Men is a, a journalist's film about journalism, The Post is, is a bit broader uh, than that. Although I was tempted to put News of the World down, but I've already mentioned that. So it's The Post actually put down. For favourite TV series, it's Succession. Uh, and I think the real life stories, well, they're almost real life, of actual media moguls are often weirder than out-and-out -out fiction. So Succession was my favourite TV series. Uh, factual media book, I've already mentioned it, is, is Nicholas Coleridge's paper, Tigers. It's a bit dated, but it is just brilliant storytelling. Uh, my personal choice for the fictional book is Ray Connolly's Sunday Morning, um, although I ought to declare an interest in that I'm related to him. He is actually married to my cousin. Uh, so he has a sequel to this planned, but his life was derailed over last year because he... Uh, caught COVID and was in hospital for six months. He's actually produced um, a play that's been aired on BBC radio called Devoted, which tells his story. So he came out of hospital just wanting to write about things. Um, but there's a sequel to Sunday Morning coming up. Um, has, it got, has it got a name or is that still um, to be... Decided. No, perhaps it's Monday morning. Don't know. <laughs> don't, don't well, know. Sunday morning too. Or, or I, 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 we'll I look out for it. I don't mm. know. Um, and I, I put Donald Trump down. Clearly, Mark Zuckerberg, in terms of the person who is currently most uh, influential, um, but Donald Trump, if he decides to launch his own news channel, I think would be is a real contender in my mind for someone who could change the shape of media for good or ill for good or Ill. well in trump's <laughs> case ill <laughs> yes i think we can safely say that jim bilton thank you very much for being our guest on the in publishing podcast lovely thank you for having me james we would like to thank advantage cs again for sponsoring this podcast Advantage CS has been developing subscription management solutions for the information industry since 1979. The comprehensive functionality, adaptability and scalability of its software helps leading publishers around the world manage their businesses more effectively. Find out more at AdvantageCS.com. Many thanks to Jim for that deep dive into our media preferences and his fascinating insights into what it all means for the media world going forward. Jim has written a number of excellent articles about the media on Media Survey, along with an in-depth review of the Tom Hanks film News of the World, all of which can be read on the In Publishing website. Just go to inpublishing.co.uk and search for Jim Bilton. Thank you for listening and do join me in two weeks' time for another In Publishing podcast, where my guest will be Marie Davis, Managing Director of Immediate Media's Homes and Lifestyle Brands. Bye for now.